All right, today on the CEO Parenting Podcast, we've got Jake Elkins. Now, to remind everybody, the, the format of this is, I, this is conversational. So you are going to be eavesdropping in on our conversation. That's the whole point of this. So I will probably say things that are not normally said on camera, and Jake will too. We will try to, we will not say things that we shouldn't say, <laughs> but uh, Jake and I know each other. Um, Jake is the owner of Ironclad Wrestling, and... For me to go into the details of ironclad, ironclad wrestling are silly, and so I'm going to let Jake talk about that. But Jake, give us the 30 second version of you, and then tell me more about like ironclad. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, man, Jake, 33, Birmingham boy. That's right. Um, grew up playing all the sports, wrestle now. Um, so we, I run a business that's sort of like travel baseball, but for wrestling, right? It's a club wrestling program. I never heard you explain it that way, but that's great. Um, so the, I am a full-time wrestling dude, right? We do jujitsu and all the other stuff too for fun, but we have a, a local gym and do that with local folks and people from all over the state really. And then we also have online training. So we train individuals coaches do like program consulting with people around the country and really the world so okay so talk to me about the local stuff let's kind of break that into pieces because from a business standpoint and we'll you know this is ceo parenting so i want to talk to about the business part of it first so and i will ask monetization questions yeah, like how do you do this what are you are you making money on this or is this just whatever so talk to me about the local part of it like the local where you've got kids from the surrounding cities talked about like like the other night monday night i was there because john was doing um, self-defense jiu-jitsu classes. Yep. John's my 13-year-old daughter. Talk about the class you were having there. What what it, What is that? So we have right now is like what we call youth wrestling season. Okay. So just like you play, there's park baseball and travel baseball. And so we treat youth wrestling like it's a it's an introduction, a healthy introduction to the sport, right? I mean, wrestling is pretty, um, it's pretty easy to mess up. So like it, where we How live. How so? I know nothing about wrestling. Okay, so like if you live, we live in, in Birmingham. There's sure. a guy on every street that could coach the baseball team or the football team and do a good job. In wrestling, that's, yeah, that's true. In, in wrestling, there's not a guy on every street that can do that, right? And so more so, wrestling is incre- like crazy emotional. So like think about a baseball kid who strikes out, throws a tantrum in the dugout, and there's like, you know, mom, dad, whoever's pissed, and they're right. yelling at the kids and whatever. You're just like, hey, everybody act right, you know. Well, in wrestling, uh, your kid's not striking out. It's more like if he if if the pitcher if the batter struck out, then the pitcher got to peg him with the baseball, right? Like mm-hmm. that's a little more like wrestling. Or if the pitcher all of a sudden had your son like in a headlock and your son saying that he's choking, like mm-hmm. so you get parents parents and kids who, I mean, you're you're putting them in a somewhat hostile, a controlled but like hostile situation. I mean, it's like a most kids when they start wrestling and they're seven, eight, ten years old. It's the first like fight they've ever been in, you know. So, yeah, yeah. That makes so you're sense. teaching them emotional control and emotional maturity, and and you're trying to teach this to the kids, but you wind up teaching it to the parents too. So, so the, at a youth level, it's very um, it, it's very easy to jack up because emotions get high, right. and so you have to have a real healthy introduction to that. You have to know a ton about physical development with kids. Um, like you know, things you teach a 17 year old are different than teaching. 100. percent Yeah. So a, a great example I always like to give is that the average 10 year old's head weighs 12 percent of his body weight. My, my, so, my son's about 17, 18. Yeah, I'm just saying, right? So, got a noggin. So, like, I got, a, I got quite a noggin, but, you know, if, if my head weighed 40 pounds, all of a sudden, like, I wouldn't get in a st- an athletic stance the same way, you know what I mean, that I do as an adult, right? Okay. And so, um, the things that we often – I didn't know that. Yeah, pretty crazy. 12% of your body weight? Pretty your crazy. Head? Yeah, so start, start doing math. You're like, wait a second. If I put a 25-pound plate on my head, you know, like, like that's, that's nuts. weird. Oh, okay. Yeah, so – so there's a bunch of stuff about human development and child development that I think is really inc- critical to understand. Uh, our buddy Jeremy Allen is yeah. a, is a expert on a lot of that stuff. He's fun to talk to. But so we just do what I would call a healthy introduction to that. You know what I mean? And so, um, and it's it's largely around youth wrestling is like uh, it's better than any speed and agility or strength conditioning program you could put your kid in. I mean, it's the ultimate as far as all those things go. And so we just treat it like if you – maybe one day you want to be a wrestler, maybe you want to be the quarterback of a football sure, team. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm recruiting your son right, right now. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Through my daughter. Yeah. And so, um, anyways, that's like – yeah, that's what we do at the youth level, right? And then at some point those kids age up and kids decide that they want to wrestle more than three or four months a year. And so that turns into, you know, travel baseball, if you will. We, we call that club wrestling. Okay, so go back to this. So you've got a 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old. Yep. And where does – so he comes to your gym – 
and practice because you guys are in the heart of downtown Birmingham, a wonderful location. Tegan, for example, he's 10. What would he do besides practice? Yeah, so we we, – Because in rec ball, you go play on Saturday morning. 100%. Yeah, so we go to tournaments. We have tournaments on Saturdays. um, And we – there's different ones. So, like, there's, like, you know, we'll do some in-house events and let them wrestle and kind of have a healthy introduction to that. I keep saying the word healthy introduction. Like – you know, most kids never been in a fight. Like, what, what's crazy is you get in a, you take a kid to a tournament and put him in a wrestling match. It's pretty like you're pretty vulnerable. You know, you're like standing out there on a mat by yourself. Your parents are screaming. There's not teammates. And you underwear. You you get wearing a singlet. singlet. Yeah, you look a little yeah. you're a little exposed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it can be a lot. And right. So then you get in like basically a fight with some other kid. And so even if you win, they get like a shot of adrenaline. You know, mm-hmm. like a, like a eight, a classic situation. Eight ten year old kid wins a wrestling match, and everyone's like yeah you know like mom dad everybody's mm-hmm. going crazy and kid walks off the mat and then just starts like sobbing crying because they got their first shot of adrenaline and yeah. they like don't know what's going on in their body and they just wow express it by crying what so mm-hmm. this thing that was a really positive experience right like it's like i don't i think it's bad because i'm crying like they just don't understand okay so here, here's my question and some of these questions i know the answer to but a lot yeah. of this is a question i don't know the answer to how many kids come in there and their parents I don't want to say the word force, but they've, they've been drugged there kicking and screaming. Um, that happens more as they get a little, like, as they're a little more experienced. So, like, kids come in. We, we I think that classically happens overwhelmingly, like in a, in a classic situation or whatever else. Yeah. We really tone back what's going on and make sure that it's, we try to make it as fun as possible. Fun, yeah. Right? Um, we say fun friends, fundamentals. And so that's kind of the order that we yeah. go in. But if you show up and just have them start beating the crap out of each other, like, mm. uh, for instance, uh, I don't have a son, but if I do, I want him to wrestle. And so, like, I'm going to find a way to drag him there. But I, I don't want to do that against his will. you got to find a way to make it fun. Sure. So um, I think we have less of those in our program. But, uh, I mean, like, yeah, it, it, it classic, happens. it happens a lot. Yeah. It happens a lot. Okay, so you're here in Birmingham. Do you have friends or know people – that do what you do in Atlanta or Huntsville or Tuscaloosa or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so definitely the same, same. There's the same type of flow in other cities, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We got a, good, a bunch of friends that do this stuff, kind of stuff around the country, um, and we're you know kind of the leaders in changing what that looks like. Right. right? So it, it's pretty cool. Okay. So you have you have kids that come in from you know six or seven years old up until probably high school. Yep. Okay. From a logistics standpoint, they come in, they they pay ironclad. How much of that of the kids coming in that are not high schoolers? How much of that is is like a revenue source for y'all? Not numbers, but like percentage wise. What are you what are you talking about? Oh man, um, we tone down the youth stuff tremendously as far as price goes and everything. Else. Okay, so it's like super watered down. So usually it's like one hundred fifty bucks a month to wrestle sure. with us. And so and that's we, once a week, twice a week, three times a week. What? Uh, up to four days a week. Oh my gosh! And so, so it's like a gym. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's like like cross gym. Membership. 100. Okay. Very parallel. Um, and so with the youth stuff, um, we water that down. So we have like basically a four month window that kids can wrestle in, and it's like 300, 325 bucks for the whole season. So we basically take the price and cut it in half. Wow. Um, okay. Just to so there's not a that hurdle to get people in the door. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so when you so the, as they age up, they get to high school. Is that a different animal? Because yes. because Johnny's got a, a coach at Trustful High School or Mountain Brook High School or X Y Z High School. How do you work with Johnny, the wrestler, where he's got to go, going to go wrestle at Vestavia High School, but he's also going to wrestle with you? How does that work, man? So that can look a whole bunch of different ways. So the way the rules are written, basically, a kid can wrestle for his high school like four months a year, and so okay. three to four months a year, and so the other eight or nine they belong to us, and okay. so we train them, coach them, all things. It's really, you know, I mean, a lot of times a travel baseball or an AAU basketball team is more elite than the high school basketball team, right? Yeah, yeah because, in a lot of ways, yeah. Because iron sharpens iron. You can get whoever in here together. So we, we'll have, I mean, 10 state champs on the mat at once on, on, on practice. And it's like, good luck, you know. Sure. <laughs> Somebody brings their son and is like, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So we, it, it's really, um, it becomes where they go to train and get better and whatever else because they're, Honestly, you can't – it's not nothing special on us or a pat on our back, but you can't duplicate the environment that we're able to create at the club, right? Well, it's like team. it's like you go – you know, Jackie, my, my wife's the head volleyball coach at the high school, and 
we watch them and, and we play, you know, Spain Park and they play McGill Tulin, who are the best in the state. But then you go to freaking Atlanta and watch the tournament where there's people from 14 states and they got the best girl from this school and the best girl from this school. And it's just exactly. like, it's the same thing. The so same so your, your example of travel baseball, AAU basketball, club volleyball. Same deal. It's all the exactly. same thing. That's why I see the kids in the ironclad singlets in some of your social videos. That's the not the off season, but I guess it's the travel season. Whatever you yeah. call it. It's, what do y'all call it? We, we just, club season. Club season. I mean, okay, yeah. Like they, um, okay. So we wrestle like, yeah, I mean, there's way more elite competition, tougher tournaments, harder weight cuts and nutrition stuff being yeah. dialed in. Like it's way more intense during club season than it is during the high school season. Right. So there, there's – it's, it's weird because, like, their peers are all around and see and care about being, like, an Alabama State champ. But, sure. I mean, we have That's great. Winning. Yeah, but it's, like, it's awesome for peer recognition and accolades. But, like, a cl- college coaches, for instance, don't care about them winning the Alabama State title. Like, wow. Cares, you know? I would have thought that would have been kind of a big deal. Yeah. It is, but it isn't. Yeah, I mean, if, the, if you live in Pennsylvania and you win a state title, big deal. In Alabama, nobody cares. I got you because wrestling is not as big. I got exactly. you. Okay, so you've got the gym, the gym esque part where like the kids come in, they pay their whatever. How else do you have you monetized? Honestly, monetized your knowledge and like what you know and what you've learned. What else? How else are you creating income by what you learn? Because a lot of what we do, what I, I, I love and like to talk about, is where people take something that they absolutely love. And they figure out a way to make money doing it. As opposed to, yes, I get a freaking job and I got to go teach high school or I got to go work at a bank. And if you want to teach high school, great. If you want to work at a bank, great. That's fine. But like, how have you taken a love of what you, what you love and what you know and made money out of it? So what are you doing on the other end as far as the, either national or global? Yeah, so there's the gym aspect right that is just like any gym yeah that, it's that's like, got its own model. like a crossfit gym yeah right? yeah and then we do a ton of private lessons a ton of personal training if you will right um that's a that's a huge value per hour thing that, yeah. that we've all done and really probably when i was starting out it's like how i paid my bills to be honest right like that was a huge deal okay now we've spent enough time in the trenches doing that that we started really like developing stuff that was really unique and I mean, yeah, it's, it, it was unique. And so now we take all that knowledge, these things we've created. And so we have an online platform called Ironclad Methods, um, ironcladmethods.com. And so we sell. Is that the like the pyramid thing? Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. hey, I'm going to get, when we talk about, when you talk about this, when we send it out, I want to get the, the graphic of that. And so people can see it because it's kind of interesting looking. So, so tell me more about that. Yeah. So we created several like new tools and resources. And this, this sounds kind of crazy, but like, uh, I've said this several times now, but like CrossFit changed the way fitness looked. Right? Yeah. And so we've created some resources and some tools that are taking us to where we, we're changing what wrestling training looks like, right? So, okay. so like we created something that I call the Ironclad Formula, which is triangles on the, on the corners of triangles, right? Like it's, yep, I saw this that. is kind of what you're talking about. And so it's, this, it's basically a process of how you drop X's and O's in football plays. Sure, right? know that world. Which is like, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a whole deep philosophy and idea there's so much that comes from that so we created a way to do that with wrestling and we teach other people how to do that okay so let me ask this just like you've got like like for example all this this not run and shoot but all this spread offenses that 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 okay so here's the background and it's that book that we read yeah awesome book so (laughs) freaking good god i told how many times i referred to that book i can't remember the name of it um the the perfect pass the perfect pass by the way i drove through iowa wesleyan university did you really like two weeks ago so if you've not read if you are a fan of football at all you have to read this book the perfect pass it is so good and so the 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 small version and i'm gonna get to the point of this the small version of uh, version of the book is this how mummy created the spread offense in a way but he took a version of Lavelle Edwards BYU old offense. Yep. Um, the run and shoot, which is like John Jenkins and all those guys, yes. um, June Jones, and then he took a version of the West Coast offense. So it is a bastard child of all that. And this dude, <laughs> only the OGs know who How Mummy is because he's yes. the one that started. Because Lincoln Riley, Cliff Kingsbury, all of these guys, How Mu- uh, not How Mummy, um, Mike Leach. Leach. All these guys came from how? They're all his disciples. They're 100%. all his disciples. He is like the Jesus of the spread offense. hundred percent. The book is fascinating. Okay, so all that being said, 
are there methods in wrestling, like for example, you've got one team that is four wide, five wide, throw the ball around, Mississippi State. Yep. They're, they're going to sling it. Okay, 100%. but then you've got Michigan, two tight ends, the fullback with his hand in the dirt. They're going to run the zone, run the stretch. They're going to run the, the counter, then the power. Are there different ways to train and do wrestling like that? So, because if I don't know, <laughs> football's no, my great, world. Great example. Yeah. No, so, so there are different like styles that you might see, like a certain coach. Like a lot of people talk about, in, if you talk about college, uh, like Iowa style is the way Iowa wrestles, and it's just like, Smash mouth football, right? Sure. And so, and people call that Iowa style. Um, Oklahoma State like to wrestle from space, right? And so they're like loosely, loosely that exists, but not, not nearly at the same level. And so that's that's really like what we're same creating. level as football. Yeah, nothing okay. like football. It, it, wrestling, if you compare it to football, is about ninety years behind the development of football. Like it's about when I when I look at that timeline from the book and. The thing, the way that people were treating and acting and thinking about the game, because there's there's not offensive and defensive coordinators in wrestling. Sure, right. And yeah. so we're, I mean, it sounds crazy, but like that's we're creating that thought process yeah. literally. And so, it, because wrestling is just kind of like, I mean, look, the way that you teach football and you lay in offense and the way that you attack a defense is like mathematical. Like it's highly strategic. Yeah, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. You talk to the offensive line guys, you talk to the defensive guys. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers, it's a numbers game. game. It's a matchup game. Hundred percent. And so. And so you take you have certain tools, assets, resources, and you leverage them against your defense, right? And so in wrestling, like we're teaching people to think that way, like, hey, this works like that does. Like, there you just draw the parallels, basically, right? And so um, it's very, I mean, it's fun, but where people are like, you know, is this even necessary? You know what I mean? That that is kind of mm. where a lot of people are. They're not they're not ready for what we're talking about in a lot of cases. It's really interesting. Okay, so. If there's someone in Iowa, or there's someone in California, there's someone in New Mexico or Texas, and they're hearing this, can their 10, 12, 15, 18-year-old, 17-year-old kid that's a wrestler that loves wrestling, eats it up, how can you help that kid? How can they use Ironclad? Is there, what, Dude, is there an online thing? Awesome that, question. Okay. Yeah, man. So, so Ironclad. I really matches. don't know the answer no, to this question. Is, no, it's legit. <laughs> so, so Iron, this is kind of why we created it, man. So, you know, I realized – so ironcladmethods.com is our website. You okay. get a subscription. It's a dollar a day or something. When to, you get the subscription, what do you get? You get access to all these courses that we created. And so think of them as like playbooks. It's This is the playbook. This is what you should Video be doing. Or? Video, text, all the stuff is in there, right? Okay. So um, – <clears throat> So you get access to all these. I mean, literally, it's like a like a playbook for football. You get video resources. There's text and and descriptions and everything. It's like reading a book on wrestling, right? And so what what's kind of crazy is, um, huh. I'll tell my story. So coming up in wrestling, you're like, you get on this thing where like if you just learn some like the move that someone else doesn't know, you can beat them, and you're like, sure, oh, this is cool, right? And that's and, your move. And so, yeah. Until, until then, Johnny over there knows that freaking move. And then Johnny stops it, and you're like, oh, man, I got to learn a new move. And so you, mm. you get on this, like, there's this slippery slope where you're always trying to look and learn new moves mm -hmm. instead of mastering your craft. And then and then there's so many different ways to do things, right? Like, uh, right. And so I always – forgive me for keep – I keep speaking in parables, but it's like, it's like going to Home Depot and looking at all the tools and being like, yeah, let's just keep buying tools. Yeah. Right? Like – what makes one you never get good at one tool that's right what makes one screwdriver better than the, the screwdriver beside sure. it so in wrestling terms it's like you t you know i do a single leg this way but you do a single leg another way and we're arguing about which one's better and someone else tells tells me another way and i'm like i don't know I, thomas i like thomas he had a good single leg but he said that you know john said that this single leg's better like mm. which, which one do i do well like we spend enough time so you can go hey just re just do this right here here's here's the answer and here's why this is the best answer for you, right? Huh. And so, because you wind up listening to like your uncle Rico teaching you about <laughs> wrestling, you know what I'm saying? Like it's <laughs> it's the worst, bro. And you're like, respectfully, I don't think that is what's best. You don't know who to trust or who to listen to. And so we right. put out resources. Our, our whole thing is we think everybody should have access to world class training. And okay. so we make world class training available to everybody. So one of the shirts that I have that you gave me it says training matters. Talk to me about like what that means, and I have another question about. <laughs> the monetization of what you're doing so the training matters like what does that mean so i think that it's it's a one of those pure concepts pure it's true about everything so like uh you have to be training if i um i find want to be in shape like i have to be training right if mm -hmm. i'm let's say i get good and then i start chilling right like i, I get really good at wrestling but then i get lazy because i'm good well then somebody beats me 
like because I'm not in shape or I'm not skilled. I haven't been practicing the way I used to, or I'm not good and I want to become good. And I'm using super generic terms, but that literally that's how people describe it. I mean, I just want to be good at wrestling, right? I want to be good at anything. The the answer is you better you have to start training. You need right. teaching, you need education, you need you need practice hours, quality, deliberate training, right? Right. So there's training in general and then the quality of training. And so I don't care if it's us learning how to do podcasts or you want to do video editing or you right. want to it's whatever reps. whatever craft it is yeah. you want to do, you gotta be you've gotta seek out good training and then you gotta do the work, right? The thing that I I notice about a lot of extremely high level people here, but here's the thing you also have to think of. So when I coached college football, we had a game for three hours a day, three hours a day, 11 days a year. You're looking at less than 35, 40 hours a year. A year. And the amount of time that you train, lifting weights, practicing film, all those things, is bonkers. But then you also look at someone like Kobe who – would practice upon practice upon practice and it's astounding that it's so important training any whatever you're doing it matters so much and how you do it but also time and i think saban's the one that said it he said two things he said you know practice doesn't make perfect perfect practice makes perfect and he's also said and i love this he said don't do it don't do it till you can do it right do it till you can't do it wrong and i think that that matters in everything that we're doing because like I just got finished training for the Grand Canyon well what am I gonna do next but I'm also always training for business I'm also and it's so applicable to everything that we do um, and that's why I love love that shirt so the quality of training is, is everything too like that I, I have so many questions to ask you about your training physically with stuff but like that I look at because I'm interested in the things that you do about quality so the the, the parable here is um, we kind of all fall in love with like 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 hard work, right? Like, sure. Oh, work hard, whatever else. So I always tell people like, you know, if you're digging with a shovel or you got a sledgehammer running, uh, you know, you, you can kind of beat your chest and feel, make yourself feel good because you're sweating mm-hmm. and you're working hard. But there's uh, – I remember I worked at the coal mine for a, a short stand. It was a super fun job. Oh, wow. I could tell you all about yeah. this. But I remember digging. I was digging with a shovel, literally, and just – it was like 7 a.m. I'd already soaked through my blue jeans, all the things. I'm drenched in sweat and just getting after it. Yeah. Just, you know, um, I think I was making 20 bucks an hour, so I was, like, not Kip. stopping. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, I was yeah. 19, 20 years old. Yeah. And uh, there was a guy sitting on the back of a tractor, and he had a cigarette in one hand and coffee in the other. And he was sitting on the tractor and he was like, Hey, move, move, son. And he like with a cigarette in his hand pulled some levers and yeah. moved more dirt than I'd done. And in, didn't in spill his coffee. Minutes. Didn't spill his coffee. And he was making four times what I was per hour, right? And so I always remind everybody, like, they don't they don't pay you for hard work or for sweat. They pay you for for getting work done. You get paid right. for productivity. So the quality of what you're doing is important. So the difference in me being on that shovel and you know, four months later, sitting on the backhoe doing his job was sure. training. I had to learn how to do. I had to that. learn how to do it, and and like that just that can be extrapolated into so many things. It's a great life, example, right? yeah. And I, dude, I'll listen. Sitting there soaking wet, watching this dude who's you know yeah. like I don't even know if he's still alive today. He I mean, probably this, he was a rough, yeah. a rough sucker. But I was like, yeah, dude, I can't believe he just did that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so we've got the the online part of it. You've got people that can sit in Texas anywhere they want. They can learn more about wrestling. So you've talked a lot about this, about d- consulting and working with coaches. So you got the gym, number one. You've got the online program that, that a dad or a coach or whoever can use. How, how are you talking to – because every time I talk to you, you're going to some higher-level thing to talk to their coaches. What are you doing with the college coaches or even pro coaches – to, and monetizing that to them what's the what's the kind of the the path there yeah so they have college coaches all have this unique problem and so the the the, the challenge here is that nobody thinks they need help until you get help and you're like oh man that was really helpful right, right? So, so there's there's really a hurdle of like pride that we're kind of overcoming with this but but what's interesting is all all coaches especially at the college level have the same problem they had the same problem that i experienced when we were doing uh, Team USA stuff, getting ready for world championships. You get all these kids who come in from different backgrounds, different parts of the country, and you've got to on-ramp them and teach them all how to wrestle. They have different 
skills, different abilities, different size, different terms, different terminology, yeah. everything. So how do I help everybody and, and make you as good as possible in sure. the least amount of time possible? And so you need a common ground and how to do that. Right. And right. so, um, so you have to, you have to really like teach these guys how to think, right? Like you have to, we need a, we need a, a common, um, a platform, if you will, right? A catalyst to have this conversation. And so being able to draw up play X's and O's on a whiteboard in, in, in the practice room for football, like in the film room, all of a sudden allows us to have a conversation about what high level sure. football looks like. Being able to do this in a wrestling program matters, right? And so right. we, we can help them understand how to like think correctly about wrestling. And then it's, it's kind of like giving a, giving a contractor a measuring tape. Like you're like, Hey man, now, now you know how to use this thing, go build, right? Mm. And so, so you teach them the, 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 the triangles upon triangles. You teach yep. that, that thought process to them as opposed to them watching the videos. They can watch the they, videos. They can watch the videos. But and still get a lot out of it, but it's more of like how do you they're think, getting you. How do you think about the things? Yeah, and then, and then we try to teach other coaches how to, like, how to remove themselves as the constraint. Coaches, coaches' knowledge is like the – and their communication, all these things are all the constraints or the pinch points on, on their – their program just like a, a business owner is a business right sure you're the you're the choke point for everything so how can we do things that multiply your time your everything right and, yeah. and allow people to um you, you can get better uh, basically the, the the gist of it is that we all obsess about what's going to happen for two hours a day at practice and so you have to ask like what about the other 22 hours so what can i do to equip my athletes to get better in the other 22 hours a day that they're not with me at wrestling practice right, right. um or if you're at a, a you know you're you have a, a business how can i make sure that everybody's leveling up and getting better when i'm not standing over them or looking over their shoulder right like like how do you how do you get rid of those constraints so that's that's kind of what i've been obsessed with and so we just kind of teach coaches how to do that and based off their unique situation you know so you've got the kid stuff you've got the, the online platform then you got the consulting that part is there what is there any other any other thing that you do that creates income for the business for the business of ironclad anything outside of those three rings not really we do yeah. i mean we kind of do the same thing with jujitsu gyms and sure and like but it's, it's all an extension of the same thing so okay so so here's my other question how much time do you spend on the wrestling part as opposed to the business part meaning meaning managing dudes or employees paying the bills um, just all the things that have to go along with being a business owner. How, how, what's what's our what's our breakdown there? Man, it is that is it's so tough. Um, on the mat is probably thirty percent of my time at this point. Like it's probably not that much, okay. right? Like being on the mat on the mat. I but, thought it'd be a little bit higher than that. Okay, but um, so it, it used to be sixty or seventy percent of my time. Sure. Um, but now I, I have other coaches, and I'm spending more time like uh writing the recipes so sure. to speak to like creating i mean if you're a business person you'd say creating the processes but yeah. how do i write the recipe for, so that i can have five other coaches teaching what's in my brain right yeah. um and so we spend i'm spending more time than ever behind the, you know sitting at the desk documenting this or, or filming it or, or producing it in some way and that has probably pulled me away from being on the mat as sure. much as i normally would be yeah but um i would say probably the the working on the business stuff is still is is very specific to wrestling a lot of it yeah i'm probably spending 70 percent of my time on the business if you wow. would uh, okay and, so talking talking about the business because you mentioned it you talk about the filming like we are a digital society so here's what's fascinating to me and you have so ironclad ironclad wrestling is on instagram it's on tiktok it's, I would imagine it's on other things too, Facebook, all those things, okay? But if you look at your Instagram, and I'm going to get a little nerdy, okay? And I know that followers, number of followers is not like a total, um, not prerequisite, but a total uh, inclination of what the business does. But you're like at 19,000 followers on Instagram because there's a lot of people out there that think that followers is a big deal. You're at 19,000 followers on Instagram. And you're at like 67,000 followers on TikTok, Okay. So I have, this, I got a, I have a whole hour of questions about this. So why, why is there a difference in one platform to the other? So I think there's totally different audiences on Absolutely. each one of them, right? Yep. So 
there's a whole lot more little kids on TikTok that are like, dude, this is so cool. And you, you can pick up whatever. Also, the, the timing of the platform. So mm. what each platform is doing at different times, like the, each platform has its own lifespan and maturity and what they're doing, um, what content is, what style of content is working and who they're pushing it out to. Like there's a whole lot with, I hate to keep saying the word algorithm, right? Like that's kind of yeah, the yeah, buzzword. But, but it is. But it's such a real thing. And so you have to understand what the what each platform is rewarding but basically i mean now there's a lot like i i, I mean I, I feel i'm almost ashamed to say but like i love tiktok uh, at sure. 33 years old because i i can find things that i care about or that are fascinating to me and i get it, fed it pretty easily yeah right and so um but it's a different type of customer or follower if you will there per in most cases than um I would say least value per customer or per follower or whatever on off of TikTok than what we would see on like Instagram or YouTube or Facebook. Right. Okay. So so you have to go walk, follow this. The sucker makes three types of videos. That's it. <laughs> it's three videos and it's rinse and repeat over and over again. And I and as I come through my feed, I stop and watch. I don't know nothing about wrestling. <laughs> You're liable to, you can take down your son at the house yes, right now. Yes, exactly. So, this so there's three way. types of videos that you do. And this, to me, this is a lesson for anybody. It's that just because, and your, a lot of your audience is on TikTok, but find something that works and rinse and repeat it. If it doesn't work, go to the next thing. But what you've done is you found three things. You're, it's talking head. It's like this. Me talking to the video camera like this, whatever. That's number one. Yep. Probably the lowest of the three. Yes. Number two is you're mic'd up and you're talking to a crowd slash teaching a crowd. These are wonderful videos. I don't know nothing about none of this stuff, but I do know that I can watch this and you you have a mic on. You got Johnny out there and you're wrestling with Johnny teaching Johnny. Yep. That's number two. Number three is these are the best. Number three is you're mic'd up and you're coaching Sam right here and you're like, it's like, it's like mic'd up NFL. Okay, <laughs> I, I love it. Those are my favorite. It's days. like it's mic'd cool. up NFL. <laughs> yeah, and I know you got to go back and watch it. Go, I didn't just say that. Just say that. <laughs> so yeah. tell me, how are you? How are you producing these? Because so like, it's so like the mic'd up with you talking to Sam, who's fixing to go out there, and you're, you know, all that stuff. That's great. So how how are you producing those and getting those out? So let me uh, let me answer this another way. Like. What I realized was there are special times and moments that are happening, just like the just the same yeah, way we're doing sure. this podcast. There's conversations that are happening or moments that are happening that like that are cool that other people would go, dude, that's pretty cool. They yeah, wish they were there. You know, like I wish I was on the sidelines of the NFL when listening to the the sound effects or whatever. Sure. Right. So we we have uh, lapel road mics. The their little. Uh, Road to whatever lapel mics they're. You got them off Amazon. Yeah, yeah, literally off yeah. Amazon. Hundred, two hundred bucks, whatever the heck okay. they are. Uh, we have those in, in a sick, you know, four K camera. Um, shout out to Sony for that. Thanks, Sony. Yeah. Sony, <laughs> what's up? Yeah. Um, and man, we just we produce the crap out of it. So yeah, we have them. We film practice. There's a lot of times that there's something that we need to like, go back. So you're out there coaching dudes. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So and like and like, what's the guy's name? He's so MJ, M M the guy that worked for me. M MJ, okay. yeah, worked for you 100. Yeah, <laughs> great wrestling guy. Horrible with food. <laughs> horrible with He's, food. Yeah, right guy, wrong. Seat. Right guy, wrong situation. So so you got him. You're out there coaching. He's across the way filming the matches, doing the thing, and. So he's he's filming the kids. So we're trying to celebrate the kids and tell their story, you know. Right. But it's but you get some context because you can hear what we're saying in the corner, and it, it makes you feel like you're like you're literally on the sideline, right? It's, sure. It's it's definitely my favorite kind of content that we're putting out right now. So how much, how many times do you film, film that? Do you film that every night? Uh, no, we film we film a couple days a week. Okay, like one, one or two get, days a week. You get thirty hours of film, and you get. Five oh, man. videos, ten yeah, videos. We, we go to a, if we go to a tournament. I mean, we're we're filming every matches that we all the matches that we can. So when you're filming a tournament, you're over coaching Johnny. You we're got coaching that mic on. camera camera mics on, walking around the thing with a mic on all day. Okay, so my next question about all that is this: How, Are you making any money? Because everybody talks about value, 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 and I love it. And we all want to give value, but it's day. over freaking talked about. At okay. the end of the day, you got to make some money off. What you you're got doing. to. So what I'm at, my question is like, because there's a lady on TikTok named Glenda Baker, 
Glenda's she, in her 50s. Glenda's She's a real estate. <laughs> She's awesome. So if you don't know who Glenda Baker is, you need, you need to follow to Glenda Baker on TikTok. On Glenda Baker. She's she awesome. awesome. I put a wrestling coach on Glenda yeah. Baker. So, like, for example, she's had people buy houses from other states from her. How are you monetizing the, the, the information, the TikTok, for, from TikTok or Instagram in the business? Is that coming? Any so, money coming from that? Yeah, 100%. So we have <clears> – <throat> what's – I mean – you know, link in bio kind of stuff. Where we don't ever really say that, but they can. You don't have but, to. But they go find. Everybody knows the deal, they ain't right? Stupid. So, so you go find. They go find stuff and catch a link. They get on methods and they start picking up content related to what wherever it is that we're talking about. Or they go, man, I just like how these guys are communicating wrestling, and yeah. like I want to hear more about this. Or they see that we've got kids winning national championships from mm, Alabama, and they're like, sure, they're doing something special. Like, how do I figure that? You know, let's see what they're doing. And so they pick it up. And grab a course or grab a subscription, or whatever. So they grab the subscription. That's how. You, so you, yep. I mean, so nerdy question. How do you? Tra- are you are you able to track Johnny from Iowa being a, and how he got there? Do you have, ask a question? I don't track their path all the way through. I mean, there's there's a way that you can do all that. But, but when I they sign up, do you when they sign up, do you say how'd you hear about Ironclad? Yes. Yeah, we okay. have some of that stuff. One hundred percent. And I can see like on because if you don't, you need to start. Doing I, well, I can see on different like funnels and whatever, sure. like how they, you know, hey, they came through this platform or something. Like, okay, I, I can. I don't honestly assess the the analytics enough. Dude, I want to talk about that more. I listen. I got to talk to your man back here. He knows a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah, right? I want to know like, more about that. I that's an area that I know that we're missing big on and and want to explore because I mean it's it's huge. It's huge, right? Um, yeah, it is so big because you can because if like one is not working you can like spend more money or spend more time, spend more effort on the other that is working. Russell Brunson is the man when it comes to all this stuff. Okay. So let's content. talk about him for a second. So, so he is like everywhere. Do you funnel, uh, funnel, no, uh, funnel hackers. Click, click funnels. Click is funnels. Thing. He has a whole, a whole, do you, like, do you do the click funnels thing? So I had click funnels first, really just out of a knot of respect. Um, he's a wrestler too. So that's, that's kind of cool. He is. That's he, right. He wrestled at Boise state. That's right. Um, but, He's he's just a gangster. I mean, I freaking love everything that guy says. He, so you I, you are you on the ClickFunnels and do I have I the program I or whatever? Use, I don't use ClickFunnels anymore because it wasn't. It, I was following another guy, a, a good friend of mine, Brandon McCatherine BMac on on um, YouTube is is a great friend of mine, and he w- is using another platform. And I was really just kind of following in his footsteps, and so I, I jumped on the same platform that he was using. Um, but ClickFunnels is cool. Uh, the ideas behind what he's doing behind are, ClickFunnels behind ClickFunnels are beautiful, and and really everybody else is knocking this off now too, right? Everybody else is kind of doing the same thing. Sure. So they he they is kind of OG on that stuff though, right? He's he's the dude. He's yeah. Hell Mummy. Yeah, he's the man. he's Hell Mummy. He's Hell Mummy. <laughs> Perfect. Um, nice he's got some great books though, like his books, um, all of his secrets books, like Expert Secrets, Traffic yep. Secrets, Dot Com Secret. Like they're awesome trilogy. Uh, maybe there's four books in it now. Yeah. Um, that I are they outdated? Anybody. Do you think, or is it all principle um, based? I, I think I think the principles are still true. Yeah, like blue oceans and red oceans, and like there's sure. a lot of stuff in there that that are really great ideas that keep you on the right path. Okay, so what are you business wrestling? Getting married to a spicy hot uh, Colombian <laughs> girl? Yeah, in yeah, ten days. I got, I got so ten days. Uh, count I have to that in there. <laughs> so what are you studying right now? As far anything, whether it be something you're doing on the side, wrestle. What are you like? What are you really like? Because you're very, very, like, you get on something that's like, kind of like a pit bull. You don't really let go. What are you studying right now? So I'm, I've been reading, uh, I think, James Nestor's book, uh, Breath. Um, and it's about nasal, basically about nasal breathing, about breathing correctly. And no I'm, way. I'm obsessed with it right okay. now. Okay. Obsessed. So Brian McKenzie is, he, he is the, the dog when it comes to that. And we are great friends. Okay. So I, I, I have to introduce that. you to him. Because yeah. he, it would be a great reason for him to come see me and stay with me. <laughs> but like, also, dude, he, if there's about the the diaphragm breathing, breathing all that stuff, he's he's it, dude. I'm, he's wonderful. I'm obsessed with this right so, now. So so here's it's what nuts. he would do. So he came uh, came to the house back in 20 and stayed. So he invented CrossFit endurance, started CrossFit endurance, okay. transitioned out of that, and then now is like solely on breath work and things like that. So he goes to police officers. And he trains them on how to lower their heart rate through breathing, whether it be a sniper or a guy chasing a crackhead. Wow. And teaches them how to control it so that they're not making stupid decisions. 
if more police stations would hire and get this kind of training, you would see less dude, less dudes shooting people that don't need to be shot. One hundred percent, dude. That's a whole topic I could get on forever. I but, know, but, but training you, matters. Okay, exactly. <laughs> so I got to get you with Brian because okay. he is a stud and you, he is just a wealth of knowledge. So I'm sorry, I no, that's, but that's a that's huge. a yeah. I, I, had, I had no idea. I've been I've been obsessed with that and with constraints. Um, just how do you get rid of the bottlenecks in? you know, in whatever it is that you're doing, right? So for me, it's coaching or, yeah. or, or multiplying my myself in business or whatever, right? It's, All right, um, great question, okay? It's not planned. How do you go hire someone that knows so much about wrestling that and you can still teach them the method, but yet get them to stay with you as opposed to teach them, teach them, teach them, go down the road and start – Johnny, yeah. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Moxon's, you know, wrestling camp. Like, how do, you, how do you, I mean, are you, does that scare you? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a, it seems like an inevitable, like, I don't think there's a great answer to that. I, Cause I don't, I don't care if you own a bank, if you own a wrestling business or if you own a catering company or you're in hospitality, whatever. There's gotta be enough upside to, for people to want to stick around and keep around. Right. I think to me, there's a, a huge like pride factor. Like at some point you go, uh, I always talk about this. This this is a weird idea. For, forgive me. I'm I'm going to jump onto it. But like, there's this this T chart, and, and I and it's like people. Let's say you know about something. Okay, we're talking about football coaching. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you start teaching me about football, and you know everything. And I come on board, and you're willing to help me because you're, you see that I don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, oh man, Thomas, thank you so much for helping me. And as I start climbing the ladder a little bit, there's always this illusion that I think I'm way closer to you than I am. Sure. And you are like, hey, listen. You're, you're just on your first lap around the track, puppy. Like, you got a long ways yeah. to go, right? And so you are trying to, insp- like, hey, man, keep going. There's a lot more there. Um, and I don't realize how far I've I still got to climb on the mountain. And so there becomes this barrier where I think that we're competitors and you are like, hey, dude, show some respect. And so, like, this pride kind of becomes the barrier to communication. And I, I haven't found, a, like, I think that it's sort of inevitable, really. But I, my, my, like freedom to that the thing that's kind of allows me to to not get you know i don't know like how do i say that not get chained or stuck on that thought process is just going hey man like growth mindset every like there's enough there's enough room for everybody to go around you know yeah i mean crossfit gyms for you know are are, are, you know horrible about guy comes in starts running the gym they bounce they bounce out yeah he becomes the the head coach the head coach goes down four miles down the road starts his own gym takes 14 people with him i mean it's just it always happens right and so if you continue to do the best thing and if you take care of people like they're gonna they're gonna stick with you you know what i'm saying and and i don't know that i mean there's probably a lot of room i bet i can learn a lot about that you know what i'm saying there's a lot of room for growth there but I, I keep myself from going insane about that by just going, hey, look, I'm going to help the next person down the road. Yeah, and I – it's – It's definitely tough because people just try to knock off what you're doing or – I mean, it, it's a – yeah, dude, that's a that's a tough situation. I just kind of went through that situation, so it's a, there's yeah, a lot sure. to it, you know. We have a – and we were the first – with our one of our companies, Table in Time, we were the first company in Birmingham to do the grazing tables and graze boards and all that stuff. And my <laughs> – my marketing team, I used to get text messages or Instagram messages all day long, almost every day of, hey, here's somebody else. Hey, here's somebody else. And it would be people in Birmingham popping up and copying because we've been doing it for three, three or four years now. Yeah. And all these, you know, every every soccer mom that's got, you know, 47 extra dollars in a, in a, in a, in a raise board <laughs> is doing these things and they're, yeah, and, you know, they're getting their eyeball. And so, yeah. you know. No, it's a hundred percent. Hey, it's, it's flattery. It, imitation is the greatest imitation form of flattery. Is the greatest form of flattery, man. Like, I can tell you like, so many. Come on, bro. It's it's so it's so petty, you know. Like yeah, you I, can't. I just yeah. There's enough, and I say this: man. there's enough money to go around. There's enough people out there that want your service to go around. Now it can get watered down, but for the most point, there's enough to go around. If you if you handle those things with grace and with class, I think people are like attracted to that, you know, and positivity. Because sure. other people see what's going on. Oh, dude, they just knocked off whatever you're doing. Or they're copycat, and they changed their name to be the, you know. And it sounds like just like, <laughs> like Oh, man, that's well, that's so cool. What a great idea. Yeah, good, good job. <laughs> Any, what else about Ironclad that I haven't even talked about? Because, like, I know it a little bit, but, like, it's fascinating because you, didn't think, you don't think how can you make a um, – 
how can you make a, a sport a business and you've done it and so what else is it what else are you doing right now that you're like super excited about man we're doing a ton with like with nutrition and mm. this is I, i'm about to i got i have questions to ask you about, sure. about us but we're doing a bunch of nutrition and like trying to get rid of of weight cutting and things and, yeah. and focusing on performance through education and eating quality foods and stuff right. and so we're doing a lot with that and, and with strength conditioning stuff just understanding energy systems um that that lead kind of yeah we're doing a bunch with that i'm studying it honestly like that, that's a question that i want to ask you sure. is, is that you're a you're such a high performer and you are a a family man business husband yeah. all things um you have a ton of things going on probably more than i even know of mm. but like still you manage to like eat clean food and you murder it at the gym mm. like dude listen you just don't say a whole lot about it you won't post your times into scores no. and let people you won't document how no. good you did uh -uh. but like Every now and then I show up at 5 a.m. just to find out, and I get running the <laughs> ground, dude, running the ground. And I just uh, – it's a huge, like, inspiration and motivation to me. But, like, what, what do you – I, I want to know what you do. What are your best practices to stay – to be performing in all the parameters that we care about as men? I mean, a good husband, father – business yeah. but like physically like how do you how do you manage that i mean you just came back from the grand canyon like sure. i have so many questions about this um i think it's you got to be okay with being with monotony um okay. because like like nutrition like what well you just mean? all of it i think you gotta my, my dad used to say you know what i'd rather be bored than be beat and sometimes the boring things that we do produce the biggest results Ooh, because, say, that again. say that again sometimes the boring things we do produce the biggest results because they're you layer them on top of each other and like i can't see over that wall right there but if i sh if i have small layers that i put on there every day it here in the next little bit i'll be able to see over that wall got it and okay. i think it's the same thing with fitness with food i am not going to get in the best shape of my life if i all of a sudden decide i'm going to start eating great it is a long-term play play the long game anything okay. that we do money fitness food whatever knowledge is extremely long term that's why old people are so smart that's why when you sit for example we sat with billy hamilton's dad you you Dude, know yes absolutely he's unreal the man he's unreal you sit there and ask questions and sucker talks slow and he has long pauses and he's just like he just spits out just like these great things my dad for my dad passed at 70 You'd ask him questions, and he just starts spitting out stuff. I'm like, you're seven years old. I'm 40. How did, how did I not know that? It's a compounding thing that I think that I, I'm okay with being bored. Yeah. I'm okay with doing the same things over and over again. I eat the same breakfast every morning. I go to the gym at the same time every day. I don't miss. Um, you know, I, heard, I heard a guy say one time, you know, it's okay to miss. Just never miss twice. Never miss twice. And so I try to never miss anything twice. When I say miss twice, I mean – you know my bible working out um the food like i'll eat okay something bad i just don't eat it much you just don't eat much no i i've heard this said um you can eat well how you're supposed to every day if you have one cheap meal we eat anything you want i'm talking about you eat great all week long and then you eat you know half pizza four beers and two bowls of ice cream you're gonna be fine yeah. if the other 20 meals you eat normal, so I think that I'm I'm just I'm just okay with with monotony and boredom. So that's the secret to doing 52 unbroken vol balls after that's, 100 cows on the rover and 30 <laughs> clean jerks. That's what you're telling me. I think I think I just know this. I just know that that it's a layered, compounding thing. That you know you also got to remember. I spent probably f five or six years training the best guy in the world yeah and over those six years you build habits and over those six years you build a base and i credit you know my time with living in cookville my time with training with rich um as a huge part of the way we are today yeah uh, because before i was there involved in crossfit i did not eat the way i did I mean, me and Jackie used to eat French fries, grape Kool-Aid, and chicken all every night when we lived in North Carolina. <laughs> and so, like, the, as things shift, I always and I've turned. I always try to turn things slow because I think when we when we make wholesale changes fast, 
um, we, it's easier to, to fall off the rails. So I, I don't even know what my, my question here is, but like, like there's, there's so many things to you that, that I think are so fascinating that people don't even like know. I mean, like for instance, that you trained in Cookville, Tennessee with Rich Froning for a long time, mm-hmm. or that you were a college football coach at division one level for a long time. Right. And like, I, I feel like there's so many things like this that, that you did and, and like, but you don't let any of those things define you. Like that's really, that's so fascinating to me. Like talk to me more about that. How do you, I just, that, that's so rare. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is like, that's such a rare trait to yeah. not have done something that was excellent once and then still be living on that for forever. Like talk to me about your philosophy on that. Um, I think that, okay. So great example is this is, and I don't know if this is applicable. Um, when we started our business meal fit, and I was working a ton and Jackie walks in the door and she goes, you know, she was getting tired of me working a lot. And she goes, Hey, when is it ever going to be enough? And I didn't have an answer for her. And then probably a year or a half later, I realized what the answer was. And I walked into her and I, and I, and randomly I said, Hey, hey remember, I don't know, a year or two years ago, you said, Hey, when's it ever going to be enough? And she goes, yeah. And I go, it's never, it's, it, it's never going to be enough. It's, it's not about the, the thing. It's about the journey on doing the thing. So um, it's not as much about winning the, the, the Super Bowl or winning the CrossFit Games or winning the this or, or getting the big deal. It's the, it's the process of getting there. So a great thing I heard the other day is when you win and you get to the end of the journey, there's not a dopamine hit at the end of the journey. The small compounding small dopamine hits are on the path to where we're going and when you see people that crash and burn it's because they don't have the next thing to go to the next thing to have that that small dopamine hit over and over again that's big right there that's real big and so coaching college football was wonderful i'm the only guy in the world that quit a job he left Mm-hmm. Okay, I love my job. My wife, my wife loved my job. My wife was pissed <laughs> when I got done because we would come home and I, we would be sitting in bed. Do, I would be doing a practice plan and she would be doing her practice plan, and we would talk about ball. She would ask me questions. I would ask her questions. I would talk about my players. She would talk about her players. But we transitioned out of that, and so I think that me not living on those things because I've got something. I know there's so much more ahead. And I'm getting my, I hate to say this, but I'm getting my dopamine hits on the journey I'm on now as opposed to living off of whatever it is we've done in the past. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, dude, that's sick. That's super sick. So talk to me, like, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, a perfect example is, uh, I mean, dude, you've done all these things, and here we are in this, like, state-of-the-art facility and Pretty cool place. all this stuff. This place is awesome. Like, tell me about what you're doing now, like, with um, – so I, I go to Highlands, um, have been there for years, love it, amazing people. Um, it's, yeah, I, I'll, I'll stay off, I could talk about that for forever, sure. but like Highlands College is this huge project and, and now, you know, I, it's one of those things that like I heard about and saw on the big screen, but getting to walk around up here anytime we come up here and have a meeting or lunch yeah. or anything in this facility, like talk to me about what this is like. I mean, you live in this every day. Sure, so a lot of people don't understand this and they hear college and they think, you know, biology and things like that highlands college is is kind of like it, they are they are doing a wonderful job and i don't think there's anything like it in the world where they're teaching people how to reach other people for jesus and for me it's the most applicable way to do to do that just it's like it's like wrestling school for wrestlers this is yeah school to teach people how to reach jesus in the most practical way now there are bible taught and things like that and they do a wonderful job at that but they are teaching worship leaders how to lead worship and it's not just to sing and play a guitar it's how do they lead a team how do they come up with set lists how do they work the the back end and the all the things that go along with that they're doing the same thing with hospitality they're doing the same thing with students they're doing the same thing with pastors so pastor chris talks about the academy model they are putting kids in the trenches weekly. So these kids go to school, and then every Sunday they're taking what they learned at school and applying it on Sunday. From the first week they're here, 
And so if you want to know about Jesus and know, excuse me, know, know how to teach Jesus to the world, this is the place to be. They do an unbelievable job. It's a multiple millions of dollar place here in Birmingham. You know, Church of the Highlands is the second largest church, one of the second largest churches in the country, led by Chris Hodges, the president, Mark Pettis, does a wonderful job at leading these people and leading these students. You know, for example, this podcast studio. State this of the place art. is state of the art. This place but is they incredible. Do, Pastor Chris does his, his in here, but also they can have students come in here and start because they know they ain't stupid. They know that this is a platform to share the gospel and they want to encourage kids to do that in so many different ways. And so I'm blessed beyond belief to be able to be here, but also just seeing what they're doing is so state of the art and so next level of, of how they're getting, putting leaders into the world to reach Jesus. Everything about it's first class, man. It's so cool. I mean, to walk through and just the, the energy like man it's incredible like yep. it's it's palatable you can oh, in the air you, you walk through it. it's awesome <laughs> it's so a question i have for you is um you're reading it you're studying with the breath are you what are you reading right now because you're a reader like i am what are you reading man so i just um i have i've been reading the, this book breath okay um, i have another book that i started i'm like maybe a chapter in it's a uh, a hunter gatherer's guide to to the 21st century so like food um no it's a like primal um like hey it, and if you're a hunter gather if you were in you know 500 years ago thousand years ago here's how you would have lived well like the world that we live in today is different it's modernized sure so here's these primitive like principles that exist in you and how you like adapt them and, and you know make sense of the world around you right like um, and it's really it, it was recommended it's 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 kind of it's deep um a a good friend of mine uh, assistant coach at UNI, and i okay Lee roper recommended it to me and he was like you have to read this book and so he wow. he he told me that i had to read breath and i had to read this and so you're doing like, it so that's what i'm doing <laughs> you know that's and, perfect. but and they're they're powerful i haven't i'm not far enough in to really be able to i guess speak on it fully but um he was kind of talking about the ideas and i'm like okay i guess i got to do this so perfect that's I'm, good i'm also somewhere in there trying to learn how to speak enough spanish to survive at my wedding next week so <laughs> that's good luck <laughs> i don't know if we're going to get there yeah they've got good coffee though and I can they have coffee, great so, coffee and so we'll survive exactly. that way that's awesome what man. else anything else dude yeah i um t- talk to me about more about <sighs> So you have, um, again, I, I just draw, you were kind of pushing on my mantra about training matters or whatever. You're, I have one of your, your shirts, and it says, um, move daily, eat real food. Eat real food and move. It, yeah, eat yeah. real food and move. Talk, talk to me about that idea because I, I find myself like, I found myself saying it like in my head. I'm like, I'm eating my meal fit meals. Yeah. And I'm like, eat real, eat real food and move. So eat real food and move. So there are so many things out there that fad diets, Work out at seven minutes a day and get in the best shape. There are so many things out there. Anybody out there, professional athlete, soccer mom, someone that's 700 pounds, whatever, if you can eat real food and you can move every day, you will be healthy. So the eat real food is what is real food? Anything that has one ingredient. If it has one ingredient, eat that. Chicken. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) If it's got one ingredient, if your 10-year-old can't put, read the ingredients on the back of the uh, package, don't eat it. That's the eat real food part. And that is so simple. And it's just, it's not, well, explain it to me. I don't have to explain it to you. Is it real? What about an apple? Yep. What about rice? Yep. We what about bread? People. What about bread? No, bread's got 47 ingredients in it. Now, is bread bad? No. Is it going to make you a gigantic slob? No. But like on a daily consistent basis, eat things that have one ingredient. Yes. The next thing is move. It is exactly what it says it is. My move is different than your move, than different than his move and his move. I don't recommend my move to someone that doesn't move every day. <laughs> yeah, well you, you just got done with a bunch of moving. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Yeah, that's, I did. That's, we can that's talk next. About that we'll talk about that in a second. So, like, sometimes your move is walk 20 minutes. Sometimes your move is work out twice a day. Sometimes your move is strength. Sometimes your move is elliptical. Sometimes your move is take a class. Do something every day. And I'll take the, I pull this from Rich. Okay. Get out of breath and lift something heavy every day. That is it. If you can, and I used to tell, I tell people this all the time. Get out of kinda, breath, lift something heavy. I love it. Yeah. That's, he said it in a little different way. <laughs> um, but like, if you can, and I say this, well, I work, I work, I'm, I landscape all day. I get that. And you work hard. I'm not doubting that. 
But I say this, get out of breath on purpose. Get out of breath on purpose. If you can get out of breath on purpose every day, you will have a better life. If you will, because here's the thing, food and exercise will cure probably 90 something percent of all the things that are killing people these days. Dude, Melissa is in the hospital every day. So my, my fiance is a doctor. She's in the hospital every day and she comes home and she like, like listen, if I, if I'm not at the gym one day, like I get like kind of shame, you know, there's yeah. like a pressure, like a, you didn't, you mean you didn't yeah. get, you, you didn't exercise, you didn't, you didn't get out of breath today. Yeah, you know, like, exactly. And, That's and her. Like, and you can't make it two yeah. days. Well, she sees, she sees all the bad. She, she sees the effect and she tells me all the time. She's like, you know, these people wouldn't have, they have 15 problems. Like they're like, they're in bad shape, you know, like, and literally all this, we're trying to treat all these symptoms, but like, if we could just rewind them 10 years and they would exercise, that none of this would be going on. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier, okay? Just the same way that people will do the small things every day, the compounding little bitty things every day, and they're bored with doing the right things. Those people just chose not to do that. And so they didn't wake up and weigh 450 and have diabetes and 14 problems. They yeah. slowly got themselves to that point. And that's the hard part. That's why it's so important with kids yep. is to make sure that they are like, like dessert. You ain't got to have dessert every day. And my <laughs> six-year-old, Georgia, does not understand that. And so it's, a, it's, a, we, we, it's, so much, it's so important to teach habits as opposed to just saying no. You give them a reason why. It's hard to explain it to a six-year-old. My 13-year-old understands. My 10-year-old does a little bit better. But it's just a habit thing. And that's what, the, that's what people that are sick, it's just bad habits stacked on top of each other. Yeah, dude, that's a great book also. Tiny Habits or yes. Atomic Habits. Atomic both. Habits, great. Awesome books, yep. awesome books on that topic. Recommend that to anybody. Okay, so move. You just got back from the Grand Canyon. I saw some pictures. It was insane. Yeah. I, I I need stories. I need. It was I got to hear about this. So we, four of us went out there, um, and we trained for about six months. And so we walked the Grand Canyon rim to rim. How far so, is that? Twenty two miles. So the south rim to the north rim. It's the it's the hardest path. It's like twenty two miles. So you start and you walk down. And I'm giving the short version. You walk down seven miles. That was the hardest part for me. Down. Because, because it is quad knee, quad knee, quad knee, quad okay. knee. There's no hamstring. There's no none of that. So you're working the same thing for seven miles. It took us three hours to go seven miles. It was straight down. And the steps were far enough away where you couldn't step, step, step. It was step, walk, walk, step, step, walk. It, it, it got annoying. So that was where I was hurting. You were thankful for a level part, and you were even thankful if it, if it went down and then went back up a little bit because you'd work something different. So you went down seven miles. So we started, it was 25 degrees. Wow, that's crazy. So did you – that is bizarre. The, just the, I mean, listen, I've run enough hills in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that coming down to the worst part. Yeah. But, but you never think about literally going down first. Seven miles. Seven miles. That Three hours. So we went and it started, it was 25 degrees, started at dark, and then we went a mile a mile into this place called Ooh Ah Point, was the most majestic point in the canyon to where you can look to your right and you can see the sunrise. Wow. And so we waited there for about 20 minutes. And I, and I got pictures and video, but it, you know, it just, you can't explain it. It's not the same. No, it's not the same. So we go down for seven miles, go down to a place in, in the bottom of the Grand Canyon called Phantom Ranch. They have the best lemonade in the world, and it was good. <laughs> but the reason, but you go down. Is it because you just finished hiking exactly, seven miles? Yeah. Like, <laughs> so you go down, and you're, saying, you're sitting there thinking that, how do they freaking get this stuff down here? Well, as we were getting to the bottom of the canyon, there was like 10 pack mules that had crap all on the side. And there was this cowboy who had a cowboy hat, chaps, cowboy boots, and super sweet brand new Oakleys, like wrap around Oakleys. It was oh, like, it. it was awesome. So he's, he's, he's bringing these mules down there and they got all this stuff. They get in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So they Holy get crap. and so we stopped at Phantom Ranch for a little minute, minute and took clothes off because we were starting to sweat because it went from 25 to 80 back to 55. That's what? this temperature swing that was in the eight hours. So we go to Phantom Ranch and then you get to the bottom, and you walk another seven miles. That's flat-ish. Okay. It's it's mostly flat, but it's like small inclines for seven okay. miles. And then you get to Cottonwood. Rock, rocky, loose, loose, like. Okay. Loose. It's loose and some like rocks. Slip, it's, slide. Oh, uh, no. No, okay. it's a pretty good path. Uh, there's no doubt. That it's the most best well-marked trail I've ever seen. And so then we get to a, a, a stop called Cottonwood. And you have to be strategic about water. If you got water, if, if you got a water stop, you need to fill up because you never know. So we go to Cottonwood. And then from that point, we're at seven-ish miles. But the last seven miles are straight up. Hamstrings. <laughs> 
Yeah. So we're at 14, about 16, 17, I start to struggle. And Rhett Gallego, one of my best friends in the world, is behind me, and he says, um, I think it's the altitude because I was struggling. And so on the 22 miles, so you'll like this, the key, okay, the key is, in my opinion, is obviously training, but the key is nutrition timing and hydration timing, not just the food, but how you eat it. So I'm 45 minutes into it, it's still freaking dark outside, and I'm eating a half turkey sandwich. So I ate, I structured it this way. I had a half a turkey sandwich and then another half a turkey sandwich and then a half peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then another half peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But I ate that really, you know, expensive bread. It's got all the protein and seeds and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So and then I ate a bag of trail mix and a bag of trail mix. So I had six items that I ate over the course of the time I was there, out there. And eating before you need to is critical. Got to stay in you, front of the hunger. You got to stay yeah. in front of it. So I get to about 16, 17, and Dusty Davis is 59 years old and ran rim to rim in six hours. It took me eight hours and 42 minutes. He is a boy dog. I'm talking stallion. And so he did a training run with us, and I am not an energy drink guy. I'm just not. I'm coffee, water, that's it. And he had a freaking Red Bull on our training run at Oak Mountain where there was no hills. (laughs) And he gave us a, a, a Red Bull, and I drank like half of it. And so the night before we go to the Grand Canyon, Rhett grabs a four pack of Red Bulls, and they each gave us one. And I get to my 17, and I am, I am struggling. Mark and Steven are ahead of me, and I'm like, dang, I don't think I'm ever going to freaking catch them. And they weren't far. I just didn't think I'd catch them. Well, then I drank half the Red Bull. And let me tell you something. Did you get wings? I had them. <laughs> just like the commercial. Bro, I dude. could not. It was like a different human being. Really? That is it was nuts. so fascinating. I think part of it is because I don't consume that kind of stuff, but I think oh, yeah, it just it just did something to me. And then we hit um, we hit a point we started getting groups, and I thrive off of meeting new people. So you had four or five miles ago on the ropes, hurting, bodies beat up, banged up, but you were just empty. I mean, I, I don't you, know. Do you dehydrated? No, like? no, I ate great. Okay. I ate great, and I just think that I was hitting a point. I was, I think it was a proverbial just second a volume. Win. Like, I mean, yeah, it was a lot. It was like uh, a lot 40, 48 thousand steps, something like that. Some, 50, you know, some fifty thousand steps. So yeah, it was just enough, that's it, enough to make a man tired. It yeah. was, and so I, 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 after that, I was fine. And Mark, Mark looks up at me and goes, "Dude, what, what is, what is all going on?" I'm like, "I don't know. I just feel better," and I felt great. Wow. So, like runners highish, like no, uh, just I just felt like I could keep going. I wasn't going fast. I just was kept going. And um, that's so cool. I would do it again. I felt like about five miles in, as I was watching the sun come up and I was with my, my boys, I felt like this would be a wonderful rite of passage for a kid as they go, before they go to college. Yeah. I felt like the Lord telling me that. I could see and that. so I think that I looked at John when I got back, my 13 year old, and I said, hey, we're going to figure out a way to do this, whether we do half in one day and half in the other, but we're going to figure out a way to do this. Because so I, I think it's just hard stuff is important for our kids. Dude, that is so cool. So, Number one, what an insane, awesome. It was experience. wonderful. I've never been. I, I, wanna, I was looking at pictures, and I was like, I have to go do this. You, like, you, I, do I, this. I think it's something that um, you and Mel could do it. Mel could do it. Uh, she's, she's disciplined enough and like, focused enough and likes hard stuff enough to where she could do it um but yeah we could go into the details of like training and all that Dude, the hard part is this there's nothing around here in alabama that prepares you for it the only thing i didn't the thing i didn't do which i read in my research on the front end that I didn't do that i should have done more was stadiums 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 like okay. walking up and down stadiums the hard part is in stadiums you walk up and then you walk down. You walk up and walk down. It's not you, down, 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 down. You can't down, do down, it. Down, down, down. You can't mimic it. And that's the hard part. So I think that's something I should have done more. I think I think indoor stairmaster stuff would be would be good. Like I mean, get putting freaking Netflix on, putting headphones on, and going for an hour, going for what ninety the, minutes. That's what I was going to ask. Like, what was the, like the volume? Like the like, how did you? It's like when I'm when I'm putting that kind of volume on my my body or something like my feet will literally go or something. Like, but that's why you, that's that's the whole. That, I'm that, in, I'm I'm physically in good enough shape to do it. Yeah, like what I do daily, weekly, monthly. I'm physically in good enough shape. The part I don't have is the time on my feet. Yep. And so time on my feet is what I had to do. So I did that, and that's where like we did ten mile hike, a fifteen mile hike, a twenty mile hike, a twenty one mile hike, and I okay. did that. And I, I I ran a little more. The people I saw on the trail. I was like, hey, how'd you train? 
that's the first question I ask everybody. How'd you train? How'd you and train? It, most of them were like running, running. It's not super applicable because you can't mimic the, the height, but like the, the, the altitude and you can't mimic the hills. But I mean, it's, you have to do the best you can if you don't have it. If you got a place that's got hills, I told, I told him if we do it again, we need to go to Chiha, which is the highest yeah. point in Alabama, which is like, you know, 1,500, 2,000 feet. And we need to do repeats. Do repeats. Yeah. So that would be something we could do. But it was one. I could see that. Yeah. Yep. That's crazy. Like, how did you, so how did your body hold up from, I mean, so I, I see you crossfitting religiously all the time yep. and murdering it at the gym. How did your body hold up? Like, did you, were you doing CrossFit and yeah. adding, adding the running and everything in too? Like, well, like on the long run days, I would get up at like, I would start at like four and we would go for like on the 10 mile, the 15 mile, the 20 and the 20 milers. I would not work out that day and then go okay. and do that. Now I'll say this, you don't need to go out there when it's hot. You can't mimic that. Yeah. So we went out there, like I said, it was cold, got to warm and then we went out the perfect time of year. So on the days that I did the long runs or the long hikes, I did not train anything else. But, I mean, you're on your feet six hours. That's enough. Yep, that's a lot. So, perfect. Yeah. Look, I, I can't thank you enough for being on here with us. Dude, um, this is awesome. Okay, so if, if someone in whatever state, wherever, and they wanted to find you, they had a kid that wrestles, they have a coach that needs to hear this, where can they go? We talked about TikTok, Instagram. Talk, t- tell me this that in a quickly. Where are the places that they can find Jake, El- Jake Elkins or also Ironclad? So you can find us on all your platforms at Ironclad Wrestling. We're on everything. TikTok, yep. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you name it, all there. Um, and then all of our wrestling training is ironcladmethods.com. Got it. That's the spot. Great. Hey, thank you so much. Dude, this you're the best. It's been so much fun. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on, man. This is cool. I'll you do this it. with you anytime. All right. See you guys later.